Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to talk about a vision of monitoring nanomaterials through the life cycle. Um, this is this is more related to environmental hazards and risks rather than to human hazard, health hazards and risks. Um, but I, this is this is very much a a look at current thinking about how we do this sort of thing, and this provides information which in the future could in principle feed back into safe by design considerations. So, just to give you an outline, I've kind of, I'm going to describe the vision in general terms. Then I'm going to uh, show a generalised life cycle for uh, a nanomaterial product and show how that then can be evolved into a product specific life cycle. And then I'm going to give you a couple um, of examples of what is the real meat of this, which is the transformations of nanomaterials as they move through that life cycle and particularly um, transformations both before and after release into the environment and how they may impact um, hazard and risk of those nanomaterials. And then finally, I will summarize. So the vision is whole life cycle tracking, monitoring, modeling, whatever you want you call it, of nanomaterials through the environment from release point to ultimate fate. So to find release points in the environment, you do have to go back to the, the full life cycle, including the product value chain, and you have to firstly ask yourself the question, where, where in that life cycle are the release points of the material into the environment? And, and from that, which are the environmental compartments that will be exposed? And secondly, what is the form of the nanomaterial at each release point? And therefore, what are the fates, exposure and hazards specific to that form, but also to any forms that may occur by subsequent transformation through the environment. Okay, so this is um, a general model of an ENM product life cycle. Um, to apply this picture to a specific product, we first study the, the product value chain, which there is summarized as synthesis, incorporation, use and recycling of the product to identify points at which it environmental release may occur. And releases may occur directly from the product value chain during use, for example, nanomaterials in sunscreens, or from the product value chain into managed waste facilities, i.e. wastewater treatment, incineration, and landfill. And this for ex may, for example, come from ENMs which are impregnated into textiles, released into domestic wastewater, when they're washing and ultimately into the wastewater treatment system and from there into the environment. So we can develop a product specific life cycle model from a generic one by considering how the product is used and if applicable, recycled or reused at the end of its life. So product here really refers to the material itself, but we must bear in mind that that product may be incorporated into a larger composite material. From this consideration, you can identify the product specific release points directly or via managed waste. And we can also define the ENM physicochemical transformations that occur prior to release. Um, now, this knowledge may be derived in part from the known physicochemical properties of the product or by experimental analysis of trans of transformation through the product value and managed waste chains. So by doing that, we get a picture of both the environmental release points and the forms of the nanomaterial in which the, those releases occur. And then this then informs knowledge of fate and further transformation in the environment, leading to predictions of exposure to organisms, which of course is the first um, step in assessing hazard and risk. Uh, it's also worth noting here that uh, regulatory regimes with differing from country to country may influence the life cycle. So, for example, in the UK, sewage sludge can be spread on agricultural land, but in the Netherlands, it has to be incinerated. So that has clear implications for how nanomaterials may cycle 
if they are present in sewage sludge in those different countries. So in the last slide, I talked a bit about um, nanomaterial form and, and transformations. Um, because nanomaterials are defined by their physical properties, they can potentially have any chemical composition. Um, and consideration of their behavior, which could include modeling, needs to take this into account um, by providing for a range of potential transformations. So I've given a number of example transformations here. For example, the release of material from an enclosing matrix, such as the release of ant uh, particles from anti-fouling paints. Dissolution of certain um, um, nanomaterials, such as silver in textiles. Chemical transformation, we'll have to come to an example of that in a moment. An acquisition of absorbed material, this could happen in, for example, wastewater treatment or in fresh waters. And a loss of a manufactured coating. To say a little bit about the potential consequences of transformations, this is still really where knowledge about what these transformations actually do in terms of changing hazard, there's not necessarily a great deal of knowledge for many of these transformations because it's also specific to the nanomaterial itself. I will show an example in a moment of where there is evidence of reduced mobility in hazard, and that is um, nanomaterials in wastewater treatment. So here we are with an example of transformations of certain nanomaterials in wastewater treatment. This is, by the standards of this, this area of science, this is a, a reasonably well-known example, that certain nanomaterials such as zinc oxide and silver, um, if they enter wastewater treatment plants, are extensively transformed to their sulfide forms because of the chemical conditions in those plants. And Relative to the incoming material, these, these substances, the zinc sulfide and the silver sulfide, they're chemically stable and have relatively low dissolution rates. Um, and therefore, we would expect that they, the, the hazard of those materials is considerably reduced by this transformation. It's worth noting that following um, leaving the wastewater treatment plant, there are, as I've already alluded to, several um, directions in which this material can go within the life cycle. It can go into sludge largely and be incinerated or applied to lands from which there are further then environmental consequences, or it could be released into the surface waters. So again, these potential pathways, differing pathways, need to be taken into account here. A second example are the transformations um, of material in anti-fouling paint. So nanomaterials such as zinc oxide, copper oxide, copper can be incorporated into anti-fouling paint, which is then painted onto ships. Um, that material can be removed, for example, by flaking during its lifetime or by the cleaning of a hull when, when it's being repainted. So that releases the nanomaterials within the paint fragments into the environment. So this may be directly into the aquatic environment. Weathering of those particles over time can then release the individual nanoparticles, which may then dissolve to release the dissolved iron. This is, this is an extremely complex set of potential transformations looking across the possible range of different nanomaterials. So one area of research is to look at whether there are specific rules or principles about these transformations that could be used in order to read across from one type of nanomaterial to another close related one. Um, if there are, is convergence of the properties of different pristine nanomaterials, for example, different silver nanomaterials or different zinc nanomaterials with different surface coatings, if on entry to the environment, those have converged in their properties and this could be used as as a starting point for grouping closely related types of uh, nanomaterials as having similar environmental behavior. And this is, this is termed the functional fate group concept. So to summarize, um, the overall vision for um, quantifying how nanomaterials transform as they move through the product value chain um, into the environment is ambitious. 
and it has to confront a good deal of physico-chemical possibility. Um, as just noticed, the possibility of grouping nanomaterials into functionally similar families for fate and exposure tracking is one way of tackling this complexity and therefore grouping and read across research in Horizon 2020 projects is an important contributor to the possibilities of generally doing hazard and fate modeling, which I think is important for the potential of doing this well for early stages of the innovation process. So thank you.